so our next discussion um, is on the topic of AI, again, arguably the hottest tech topic of 2016, and specifically what it means for the future of your customer relationships. It's actually a question we at Sapphire increasingly get from CXOs and CIOs at large enterprises that have a lot at stake. Questions like, what is the best way to begin experimenting with AI in my enterprise? What kind of risk should I take on? How much risk? How much control should I give up? And at the end of the day, how much of this stuff is even real? So I genuinely mean it when I say that I couldn't think of a better group to weigh in on this topic than the, than the folks we have rounded up for you today. We have innovators in robotics, image intelligence, and natural language processing. And our moderator today, Erin Shohat, is not only one of the most successful and respected venture capitalists in the red-hot Israeli tech ecosystem, but he was also the founder of Face.com, the facial recognition startup that Facebook had the wisdom to acquire back in 2012. So if your Facebook accounts have been getting just a little too good for comfort recently at recognizing who's in your photos, you can go yell at Eden later on. It's probably his fault. And with that, I give you Eden. Sound? Sound? Yeah, yeah, perfect. So my saving grace is when we sold uh, Face.com, we were at 89% accuracy. They're now at 97.25, so at least that part of the blame is not on me. <laughs> but it's, it, it, it has been uh, becoming scarily useful and, and accurate, and part of the reason is a technology called deep learning that we'll speak about uh, today. So kind of structure-wise, what I thought would be good, because uh, there is a heterogeneous crowd is to give you five minutes of background of what has been going on with deep learning and AI, and then jump into the panel and, and allow people to introduce themselves. So the good outcome from today, uh, that's my KPI, is have people here initiate investigations into AI within your companies. Right? That would be a good outcome. If you don't get to that outcome by the end of the panel, make sure to storm my co-panelists and make sure you understand it to the depth that you want because industry-wise is changing. Every industry in the world is changing. If 1995 was the year of the internet plus something equals startups, if 2001 was open source plus something equal a new startup, if 2005 was social plus something equals startup, 2008 mobile plus something equals startup, so 2015, 2016, 2017, that's where deep learning plus something equals startups, and these are the disruptors of the industries. So I highly urge everyone here to look at this by the end of the panel. So a quick five minutes of what has been going on. All right, so neural networks have been all the rage in the 80s, but they did not work. And most of the perception at the time was they just cannot work. We had it wrong. It will never work. If you speed up to what has been going on in the last three years, it's working. And the reason why it's working and the reason why it didn't work before is there was no computational power. Right? So the neural networks of the 1980s were basically four, five, six layers of neural networks, and that's it, and the results were subpar to actual tuned classifiers. But today, now, one of the, the, the latest research can go up to 200 layers of neural networks done on GPUs that are speeding up much, much, much faster than Moore's law. Actually, within the last three years, GPUs, graphical processing units, the thing that runs neural networks, have sped up 50 times, right, in three years. So that but well beyond Moore's law, that is the enabler of what's going on in the industry. Uh, I'll caveat, the, the primary caveat we need to keep in mind is uh, that AI has been mispredicted by both experts and non-experts in the past 20 years. So all the predictions have been proven wrong, and, every and by the way, by, by the experts are even more wrong 
than the common person. And what they've been doing is they revisit when will AI come in a graph that looks like exponential. So the, long, the later it is, the later they think it will be. Right? So that's the big caveat. But narrow AI, which is what we'll be talking about today, is working. Right? It is, we're now at the age that it is working. Scale has changed. The big leap is uh, people here, have you used voice recognition recently? You notice it's working, right? And that's the difference between 85% recognition and 99%. So at 80% 80, 80 it means that every second sentence you had a wrong word. Right? So that cannot work. But deep learning has changed that from the 80, 85 to the 99. So that is a dramatic shift. Face recognition, again, was at the 80%, which means that if I compare two people, there's a 20% chance that it's wrong. Now, at 99.25%, it's right more than humans. Right? So that is the impact that we're seeing. To the point that Elon Musk and other industry luminaries have started OpenAI with the concern that AI will take over the world. Right? So very, very smart people think something that I disagree with and would be good to hear the panel in a sec. Of, can it happen? Can actually AI go wrong, uh, rogue? So these are some examples of narrow AI. Um, one thing that is interesting is that uh, deep learning and AI recently is open source. Many of the people that come from the academia are actually giving up older source code. And that is speeding up a lot of the evolution of deep learning. The reason they're doing that is not because they believe in open society or giving back necessarily, they believe that data protects them. And part of the interesting thing for the people in this crowd is think what proprietary data do you have that would allow you to use these kind of new AI techniques more efficiently and use that as a competitive edge against your competitors. Right? But also think of how you use humans in order to generate that data to teach those systems so they can do the pattern matching they do so well. There's still a lot of work to be done. Non-narrow AI uh, is, you can think of a kid, right? So if, if one of your kids touched electricity, within the second time, they actually would understand that you should not be touching it. You can equate deep learning to needing to touch the electricity, the electric wire 10,000 times, and then it actually understands that you must not touch electricity. So the, the next, you still have a lot of work uh, to get done. With that, what I suggest is let's, let's do a quick round of background and then try to talk about the different industries. We cluster the different industries in the room and think of what's going to be the impact of deep learning and AI on your industries in tomorrow, months to come, years to come. So please. Sure. Uh, my name is Matt, and I'm the founder and CEO of Clarify. So we do uh, video and image understanding, all with deep learning and neural networks, um, as was just mentioned. So we saw, um, when I started the company three years ago, this big gap in using neural networks compared to what was being done in computer vision previously, which was a lot of edge detection and color recognition. But it's really hard to go from those small primitives to how, how is uh, the image containing a person or a tree or a dog. And so these neural networks very simply learn from the data. And that gives us a huge advantage because we can use the same core algorithm, these neural networks, across different uh, verticals. And so we uh, offer up this technology as an API platform so you can build whatever application you want on top of it. And we work with people in travel, retail, consumer photos, medical applications. Anywhere there's an image and video, our platform should help your business understand your content and get the value out of it. So that's how uh, Clarify uh, works and we're all based in New York and there's like 33 of us today. Um, so we're growing really rapidly and we just closed a really big round of 30, 30 million. million. Dollars. Congrats. Thank you. Um, so that'll help us grow even more rapidly. So, yeah. And ImageNet yeah, so when I started the, the company, I was coming out of my PhD, which was at New York University. And there was really four great schools that were focused on neural networks since the 80s. And New York was one of them, uh, and Toronto was another, which I did my undergrad. And so I was fortunate enough to learn from some of the experts and the pioneers of this field. 
And right at the end of 2013, when I incorporated the company, I submitted the first neural networks I had trained to this annual competition called ImageNet. And this is the competition that really sparked the, the flurry of interest in translating these computer vision algorithms into using neural networks. And Clarify ended up winning the top five places in that competition uh, in 2013. So we started off with the world's best image recognition and have continued to improve it very rapidly. Awesome. Um, hi, I'm uh, uh, Chris Hammond. I'm the, uh, the chief scientist uh, and uh, one of the co-founders for a company called uh, Narrative Science. Uh, my background is actually um, sort of old school AI. Um, when I'm a professor at uh, Northwestern University in, in computer science uh, doing that. Um, my focus is on, is less on sort of, uh, the, sort of the recognition side of machine learning um, or the recognition uh, side of, uh, of AI and more on the uh, communication side. Uh, and so what narrative science does is uh, we have a technology called Quill. And Quill looks at data. That is, numbers and symbols uh, that you would normally expect to see in a spreadsheet. Um, it looks at that data. It figures out what's going on in the world on the basis of that data. And it turns it into a narrative, an English language description of the world based upon that data. Um, but it doesn't just tell you about the data. It tells you about um, what the, what's actually going on in the world through the lens of that data. Um, and uh, the notion is that you would take something like um, all your Salesforce data, and rather than uh, sorting through it, um, Quill actually writes a story about each and every one of your salespeople, how they're doing, what they're selling well, what all your products, how which products are selling well, and what in what uh, in what regions, um, uh, how the entire team is doing at any level of grain size, uh, based upon uh, the data that's there. And it's the notion behind the company is really kind of simple and based upon the following question I'm going to ask you. How many people in this room in the past month have looked at a spreadsheet? Yeah. Fantastic. Think about how unbelievably crude that communication method is. You look at a bunch of numbers, you figure out what's going on, and you now know what's going on in the world because you've done some calculation. The calculation you're doing, the correlations you're looking for, the relationships you're finding are not rocket science. And in fact, for every single one of you in this room, um, you are working well beyond your pay grade doing that work. Um, but uh, that same work can be done by a machine now and turned into exactly the language with exactly the insight and exactly the information that you would have wanted to get uh, by looking at that spreadsheet on your own. Um, uh, and we're, we're kind of industry agnostic. Um, and, but one of the things that we're really focused on is the notion that um, when you're interacting with the rest of the world and you're doing things for your clients or your customers, um, you start gathering data about them and your performance regard, with regard to them and things like how their portfolio, for example, might be doing um, or how your ad campaign for them might be doing. Um, and reporting to them at scale is incredibly difficult for us if we've just got humans in the loop. But for a machine, it's incredibly powerful. And so a new layer of personalization is now possible. Uh, not because we've got a lot of data scientists and a lot of clever people writing things up, uh, but because the machine can be in the loop. And so personalization via artificial intelligence the machine is now a possibility. So Melanie, if, if you look at your background and what Fetch does, also keep in mind when you talk as to how, if you look at the old kind of car manufacturers and how robots were working there, how does the new world of general purpose robots in mm -hmm. fetch solves for the manufacturing CIOs in the crowd here? Yeah, so, I mean, fetch what we make are autonomous and collaborative solutions for the logistics industry. Um, one thing to note is that it, when you started, you said that AI, you know, hasn't, no one's ever predicted it. But the, the thing is, is that robotics and AI actually have a similar problem in many ways. We have a really bad PR campaign. Because if you look at the 80s, some of the technology that people rely on today, like um, OCR for checks and things like that, in the 80s, it was like the holy grail of AI. And now we take it for granted. The same with face recognition yeah. and things like that. And so... If you if you look at if you look at the way technology evolves, a lot of times we rebrand it. We don't we don't have robotic cars. We have driverless cars. We don't have um, uh, robotic teller machines. We have ATMs. 
Um, and so I, I think that when you when you look at what what Fetch does is we we actually take technology, in all honesty, that was uh, algorithmically created in the late 1990s, early 2000s, and we've made it robust. Um, so the thing that everyone says in robotics and roboticists say is solved, we actually turn it into the 99.99%. Um, it can uh, behave autonomously in unstructured environments. Unstructured environments has is, is always been the holy grail. Um, but it, I would say even today we would call it semi-structured because the environments that we work in, like manufacturing environments, have rules. Um, and they have uh, specific methodologies that are applied within that, within that environment. Unlike in the real world with people uh, in your home, you, you, you can buy something that was hand carved from Fiji and that's a bowl. Um, but you know, training a robot to know that is very hard. And so if you look at the technology that Fetch predominantly uses on the robots, uh, we use a combination of uh, hierarchical state machines, uh, in conjunction with supervised learning. Because the problem is, is that when you look at, at the, the thing that we are putting into the world, it has the ability to, to physically reach out and touch you. And so uh, AI is, is all great and everything, but you know, the, the premise that, that, that you, you have to do it 10,000 times to learn that you, you're, you've shocked yourself, the problem is, is that the, you always need a negative behavior. And what's a negative behavior for a robot in a real environment with a person? Um, it's usually a safety critical thing. And so you wouldn't want to just let AI lo loose with robots um, in, in a building because next thing you know, you have a robot in the gentleman's bathroom and you're like, well, robot, really, I didn't, didn't expect you to be here today. Um, and, and so I think that, that it, Fetch, Fetch is, is pushing uh, technology forward. We're, we're making robots more intelligent. Uh, and, but the thing about robots, and this is, this is something to the point of neural networks, is that robots are, are power-limited autonomous units. And so if you look at AlphaGo, AlphaGo is the big thing that everyone talks about. It's exciting. Man, a computer beats a person four times out of five. But the problem is, is the power needed to play that one game against that one person uh, I read it was uh, 16,000 times uh, the energy that is needed to raise one person from infancy to adulthood. <laughs> and so, so when, you, when you look at that and you, and you apply this, 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 this awesomeness of neural networks and AI to robotics, there's, there's, a, there's a translation error in terms of power, in terms of mechanical capability, pricing, things like that. But we are working on a day-to-day -day basis to, to improve that. So just terminology-wise, supervised learning means taking a data set, a training set, and actually and telling the computer what is the expected outcome, right? That's part of supervised learning. Unsupervised learning is kind of still the holy grail of yes. what's going on, meaning, hey, figure it out yourself and, and, and work from there, right? So just keep that in mind. Another major thing that is no, I'm sorry. I was, I was. I just love the. I love the the uh, the the argument that the machines will never kill us because we're cheaper. <laughs> oh, but, oh, I, but, I didn't but, hear but that argument. But it's being, it's, it's being handled right now. So the next generation of chips, right? So the CPUs, it's too expensive. Turn into GPUs, graphical processing units. Yeah. Now they're building specific chips for neural networks. So they're getting rid of the power issue, or at least partially. Yeah, and so it's 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 on it's. It's they they will still be able to kill us. The, the, actually, there's a... Um, <laughs> Give it 50 years. I think yeah. there's, a, there's an important, uh, aside from supervised versus unsupervised, um, I think there's an important uh, distinction to be made between, uh, 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 between sort of machine learning and, and AI in general. Um, and in particular, I think for deep learning. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think that the strides in deep learning have been like, almost unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, almost unbelievable. Uh, and, uh, and as a result, we can, we, you know, we've got, we got facial, facial recognition, uh, we've got voice recognition. Um, uh, but I think that uh, uh, sometimes that people get confused, uh, particularly in voice, that recognizing, that recognizing words is the same as understanding what the words mean, is the same as understanding what they mean together, is the same as understanding what they mean together in context, is the same as being able to respond. Mm -hmm. And I think, make, I, I, think, I think for me, uh, making sure everybody's got that, clarity in their in their minds that is that um, 
uh, you know, there's a ton of technology now that allows us to look at and recognize things in the world, which is, which is like a great first step. And, but then we've got to think about, okay, once we've figured it out, how do we actually contextualize what we've discovered, and then how do we respond to it? Um, and I think so, AlphaGo, and this will be my last, AlphaGo is a great example of this, where mm -hmm. AlphaGo is a, tremendous, uh, is a tremendous stride forward and unexpected uh, with regard to deep learning. But there's also a decision tree sitting there mm -hmm. that's making decisions. That's, and yep. it's like recognizing the board and deciding and making decisions on the basis of the board. And those two components, I think particularly as we're looking at the world where we all want Alexa to be, you know, to be at our beck and call, though making sure that, that people got those two, have those two worlds in their heads, think, I think is super important. Think of humans as a margin problem, right? Humans cost money, right? So now anything you can automate, any pattern matching can now be done, right? That's the big change. You still, general concepts, still not in the realm of what gets done today in AI, but it's moving so fast that who knows what will happen in five years. But the technology for pattern matching, for automating human activity is there right now and you should be taking advantage of it. And to, to that point, so if you look at, at apparel, right, uh, there's, there's good CIOs from here, consumer goods as well, image recognition, right, the changes that have been made, what are the opportunities that people here in the crowd have in taking advantage of these kind of advances. Yeah, there's lots of opportunity for retail, in particular, both in the physical store and online in your product catalogs. Because now we can actually understand the imagery, understand the text around it, understand the pricing and the user reviews. We can understand all this information, which gives much more detail and context for the system to automate a lot of understanding about your users, which is ultimately what everybody cares about. And that's exactly what we heard last night from Burberry. If we can understand the users better, then we can suggest what they're going to buy even before they know the new release is out or they've ever seen a new product. And so um, by understanding the underlying media content, you can make that possible as long as you can learn very quickly. And so this notion of 10,000 examples or, or whatever to train a system that's what Clarify has been focused on a lot recently, is getting away from that notion, getting away from needing GPUs. So as, as consumers of Clarify's technology, we just launched something that lets you train from the very first example. And it learns, um, think of it as teaching your product catalog or teaching the name of your mom or your pet dog. You can teach it things and it learns in real time and gives you instant gratification. And so that can be applied to your retail domain for your products, but it could also be applied for your users' habits as they're clicking through your website, understanding for that user in that browser session what they actually care about and making recommendations based on that. So that would all work on the, on the e-commerce side of things. But if you step into the store, you can picture any, um, I don't know if there's cameras in this room, but any camera in the store could be made, sorry, could be made intelligent um, and use face recognition and combine it with object recognition. So think of a family coming into your store and um, there's a mother and, and daughter and uh, a husband and um, one of them's carrying the basket. Um, so that's an important factor that you could recognize automatically. The child, uh, you could recognize as a child, and they're probably not going to be the one buying a product. So if you're changing your, um, your sales force to go out on the floor and, and talk to somebody, um, you can dynamically kind of set them out to, in the store to, uh, to find the right people to talk to to make decisions. Or you can even change displays, say, behind a deli counter um, to target the exact person based on their previous behavior and the exact person who's carrying the basket, for example, and even see into the basket what other items they have. So there's a lot of information just from visual alone that you can now um, get into your, into your stores and into your product catalogs to make much more intelligent decisions about what your users actually care about. Which obviously raises privacy questions, right? Which is, is, is part of the issue, and it's actually really interesting to see what kind of solutions will there be for all this data going around, because at the end of the day, there's perceived privacy is equal privacy divided by value, right? So you still, if you provide value, then perception is, is different. So also keep that in mind. And uh, there are so many ways to use data. There's a company here called Anodot that actually look at your business metrics and find when things are out of whack, right? So you can even use deep learning just as, a, as an analyst that if, if 
a human w would look that conversion numbers are going down, of course they'll alert you on it, but humans can't look at all the numbers all the time. So again, it all depends on the value uh, that you get. So if, if, if I look, uh, you started something really interesting about hype versus reality, and I think it'd be good to, to start with you. If, uh, if you look today and the open AI, they will take over the world, cyber will kill us, <clears throat> Um, what, what's, what's your take on, on how real is that? Well, we're kind of in trouble because they're doing it on our robots. But um, uh, I would say that, that it depends because if you look at, if you look at um, the hype right now, uh, we have what people call face recognition, what people call natural language processing. But the problem is, is that those work in highly constrained cases and they're actually supported by people taking the pictures. And so once, once you are on a physical device that has no semantical context for this environment, and I said, go in and take pictures of all of the people in this room. See, you already have a lot of leverage when a person walks up to someone in this room, squares their face in the center of the image, they're looking directly at it, it's well lit, and then you do image processing on it. Now set a robot loose in this room and say, find all the people and take pictures of them. I mean, that is, that is a huge bar. Um, and the same, the same happens when talking with, with uh, devices that are not directly connected to a microphone or within 10 inches of your mouth. Uh, you, if you want to yell at a robot in a, in a room like this or even with any kind of significant background noise, you're, you're pretty much SOL. Uh, it, if you look at most of the things that people, people do today to kind of jump through that is if you, if you look at any demonstration with a physical platform like a robot um, and, and doing natural language processing is you, people always have microphones on. It, it, or, or they talk like this, hey robot! How are you today? And you know what? What's really hilarious about that it's is... It's like children. Yeah, it, but it's even worse than that because if you look at, if you look at um, the history of robotics and automatons, so in the, in the World's Fair in 1930-something, Westinghouse actually did something very similar to this. It, it had something called Electro where it had 42 <laughs> functions. One of them was smoking a cigarette. But the way that they activated those functions was the person spoke in a cadence that was then transmitted through a microphone to create pulse single signals that were then read by vacuum tubes to interpret what they were saying to trigger behaviors. And, and in some cases, some of the things that we do today for, for interacting with devices in ambient environments is very similar. We truncate our speech, we make it extremely <laughs> loud, extremely clear, um, and we try to eliminate as much of our accent as possible. And so I would say until we, until we can, can generalize some of these, these things in, in a way that you can take autonomous units that, because the problem is, is, is if, you, if you look at a, a, our robots today, I, I would say that they have the intelligence of a very smart golden retriever. Um, and so, or, or maybe a, a two-year-old. And, and Rodney Brooks is very famous for saying that the minute you have a robot that has the intelligence of a five-year-old, then we're somewhere. And I agree with him. And so the, the problem is, is that you need to be able to set a device like that loose in an environment like this and be able to do the things that we can already do today with highly uh, selective, uh, I guess, uh, advantaged images because people are great at doing really simple mundane tasks. And then when you run algorithms against it, it works really well. But if you don't have any of that base intelligence, it doesn't translate very well. And so that's where I think where some of the hype breaks down is people miss the, the simple things that we do very well mm. and, and cast them on to the behaviors of autonomous units. I'm going to steal four more minutes of time. Just saying. <laughs> so uh, you're, you're an ambassador of uh, the X Prize. Uh, with AI, oh, right? Yeah, and I so think uh, the reason I'm, I'm raising that is to use that as an innovation vehicle for people here uh, posting actual challenges inside their organizations and thinking through how to use that as a change maker for what's going on here. So kind of the dynamics of what the XPRIZE for AI means. Yeah, so the, um, the um, IBM has uh, supported a, a, an XPRIZE in artificial intelligence. Uh, and in fact, one of the challenges is, was and the, the, the idea of the X Prize is that it's a four-year uh, there's a four-year challenge 
Uh, there's a monetary reward for uh, any team that hits uh, certain milestones, uh, and then a TED talk and a sort of a, 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 a sort of a wonderful holy grail of if you could do it, um, uh, we'll um, uh, we'll give you a great prize. So teams will sign up to to try to accomplish things. But one of the issues was uh, one of the issues in the in the X Prize was well, what's it a prize for? And because it's like it can't. I mean, you, you're going to say, well, it's for it's for artificial intelligence. It's like yes, but what is that? And so part of the challenge has been breaking things down into the pieces, so we can start thinking about well, there's there's the there's there's all the recognition work uh, that that needs to be done. There's all the assessment work. There's all the inference work. Uh, there's the the sentry components. Uh, there's the uh, trying to to you know look at what's going on in the world, figure out what's going to happen next, and then figure out what do I do in response to it, and breaking those down into the individual components. And some of those components we're doing incredibly well right now. And some are, uh, actually some we've seen, we, we, you know, you interact with every day, but you don't really know about. Um, uh, and, uh, but the notion is that when you look at, um, when you look at what's going on in your organization, um, one of the things that you want to ask is, when you look at a task, is really ask yourself two questions. Uh, and that is, one, is this task driven by data? Is there a lot of data here associated with this task? Um, and then the other question is, when I have someone do this task, um, are they depending entirely on this data? Because if they're in, in depending entirely on this data, you probably have a little piece that can be automated. Um, because the, 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 the wave of, of uh, success that AI is seeing right now, um, and in particular machine learning is seeing right now, is about speed, but about data. Uh, because, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a... Uh, um, a neural net, uh, no matter how many layers it has, if it doesn't have enough data, um, you, get, you give it a thousand examples and it does a mediocre job of learning. You give it a hundred thousand examples, ah, oh my talking. god, it's magical. Yeah. Uh, you give it a million examples and, and it's hard to be wrong. And then it's overfitted. Yeah. <laughs> but then, well, that's, that is, that's, that's taking, paying attention to the fact that there are constraints in those examples. Um, but the notion is that if you look at what's going on in your organizations and start thinking about tasks that are, some of them are actually pretty high level, but mostly rote tasks that look like, oh, this is a thing that we totally depend upon our data for. And, it's, and the people who do it just are looking at this data. And we even train them specifically how to do this task based upon this data. That thing you can pull out and hand to your innovation team and say, you think you could just build this for us? You think you could automate this and make it into AI? That's, um, that's perfect. That's perfect. So one last question. In a world where there was just a bidding war between Google and Facebook on a, just a fresh PhD graduate that ended at $4.5 million a year annual compensation. So in a world like that, so let's assume that people here will not hire these people. What, how would you recommend first steps for them to dabble in this? What, what, instructions should they give uh, to what kind of people? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we saw happening. I had a big offer from Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and <laughs> Apple when I was graduating. That's a surprise. Um, Baidu. Yeah, there's lots of, all the tech giants are putting lots of money into this space because they see the huge value. And so that's exactly what Clarify helps all of you guys do is jump to their level or even beyond and have that integrated without having to hire these PhDs in this field. We can help your business. I, I thought there was no pitching. Uh, no, I, was, I was just help, I was explaining um, how, to, uh, how to help them. Uh, but that, that's exactly why we started the company, um, because we can help all businesses and developers get the same technology into whatever application you're building. Key SDK is just buzzwords that they should give to the heads of innovation that they should be looking at. In, in what, robotics? No, in, in AI, and in, for them to, yeah. to start. So Torch, yeah. that would be one API that keep in mind, direct them to it. Pieces of data that they should be looking at. Uh, the, one of the hacks for a company called Via uh, was that they did the Freedom of Information Act on the city of New York to get all the tax information. Uh, that's how they hacked to get data for their training set. Think, much, much like Chris said, look at where there is data. Look, look for your own data. Yeah. Look, at, look, at, I mean, look at where you have you know, you know, the last five years of transactions. Um, look at all your, look at, look, at the, look at the data associated with, um, 
I mean, you, you all, uh, you all uh, make use of SAP. Think about how much data you've stored already. Um, and think about Salesforce. Think about every place where you have been holding on to, grabbing and holding on to this world of big data, and you've been wondering, what do I do with it? Start looking at that data from the point of view of what could it really support, and then think about it from a learning perspective. Think about it from a reasoning perspective. Uh, and that, I think, is, and don't hire 20 data scientists. I mean, I think what you're doing is, is magnificent. And that is, you don't need to redo what Google has, has done or Facebook has done. You don't Google have to NLP. It. They just released cloud NLP. Yeah. I think we're getting our signal uh, right over there. So, so for everyone here, next coffee breaks, make sure you storm the people here. Make sure you take advantage of the knowledge that you have in the room. And thank you all. Thank you.